Hi, this is Carol Smaldino, and welcome to The Human Climate. My guest today is Ben Tuman. And Ben, you, I think, describe yourself as a historical satirist. Um, and, or I could think of you as a satirical historicist or as a satirical, his, satirical historian. I know you don't want to be called a historian because that sounds too formal and maybe too grandiose, but in this day and age, I think you're searching for the truth. So that's enough for me. So I, I want to thank you for being here. You know, I have a book called The Human Climate, and I have uh, a chapter called Don't Know Much About History, in which I, I challenge myself, basically, in terms of some of my own assumptions. And uh, I also talk about the personal history of all of us and how we tend to be caught up in mythology. and. We're not really groomed, groomed, that's not a good word these days. We're not really helped, I think, to metabolize imperfection and being wrong. And I actually, in preparing for this, I was thinking that imperfection may be the luxury of the affluent and largely affluent white people, I'm just guessing, who are in self, you wanna interrupt me? I was just, would you say that again? Misperception? What was the word you said might be the luxury of the affluent? Imperfection. Imperfection thing, okay. You know, the movement to lean into imperfection. It's, it's been a, um, a kind of self-help, zen, online, very, very popular notion. But I don't think it always translates into really looking at our history and looking at the present, you know, we're not, so um, we're not really taught that much about history. And I, you know, just in terms of my own background, I, I just want to say that I probably was insecure enough to want to have people on pedestals. So when I studied history, so to speak, it was like, I loved Abraham Lincoln. And when I was a junior in high school, I read um, the American, American political tradition by Richard Hofstadter. And I just went into like a terrible state when I found out that Jefferson had slaves and stuff about Lincoln that I promptly forgot really that he said different things in different places. So. I had already thought about history and how certain leaders like Putin had said that they want to have, let's say Stalin taught in, in ways that would uh, embellish or help the self-esteem of children, which is like kind of the opposite of what you think of as really teaching history and then helping people digest the difficult points so you can actually learn from it because you know, we say it all the time, if you don't, if you don't learn about history, you're doomed to repeat it. And it is true, but you can't just learn history. You have to like learn it, learn it. You have to like take it in and learn from it. So when I read the New York Times profile of you in July of 2021, I said, oh, I have to meet with you because you're talking about skipped history. You're talking about the stuff that we skip over and you're trying to say something about it in funny ways, but in, in, in ways that can help, I, I think kids and adults. So anyway, so thanks for being here. I know I've been very sure. persistent. Yeah. Well, I, thanks for, for having me and uh, thanks for the, the kind words and and thanks for sharing your your own journey. I I'll just I'll have to say right off the bat that I I don't call myself a historian mainly because calling myself a historian would be an insult to actual historians. But I appreciate that you would include me in such an uh, estimable bunch. Um, I think you've I mean to me you've already touched on a few very interesting subjects, and I think like. Um, Right off the bat, I think you're raising a question of what is the teaching of history? Like, what does it mean to teach history? 
And different people would answer that question in different ways. And historically, I know there, ha- there are two sides to that question, both of which you've touched on uh, to, to put, you know, to, to generalize a bit, but one is the teaching of what one might, <laughs> one might say actually occurred in history, whether, whether no matter how painful uh, or sordid it might be. And the other is teaching uh, an embellished version of history that is not meant to teach an objective, a necessarily objective version of, of, of events, but rather bring out in or foster in, in young people a, a sense of loyalty or patriotism or whatever values people want to instill. And yeah, I think that's an ongoing question, as you, an ongoing debate, as as you see in the U.S. right now, with um, uproar over critical race theory and the sixteen nineteen project. Like, there is a very differing, very different philosophy uh, between liberals and conservatives about how to teach history and what the point of it is. And I don't know. Uh, I yeah. I, I'm not, I don't think it's a matter of insecurity on your part to, to want to idolize people. I think we all do, (laughs) or if that's insecurity, then, you know, I'm guilty of having the same insecurity. Um, But I think it's part and parcel of a a larger, um, a larger conversation and a larger history of, of not teaching what has actually occurred. Of course, there's many caveats there about, you know, everyone has a different view of, you know, you can re, you can interpret history however you want, but uh, yeah, just on a philosophical level, I think you've already touched on some very contentious issues. Okay. Well, you know, when I said a part of my insecurity, I, I guess I think from my own point of view, which Um, is decidedly liberal, but also developmentally oriented that when we're little, we're supposed to idealize and then we're supposed to be helped to realize the imperfections in our caretakers, in ourselves. And if we are raised with empathy and not a punitive um, way, let's say, then we're supposed to be, I think, able to digest imperfection and being wrong so that we don't really need the pedestal so that we rely on ourselves more to evaluate the fact and to evaluate the person and to not expect everything from one president, which I think is a little bit going on now. You know, like Biden is has, well, 27 things on his agenda, but he didn't do that. Okay, well, I don't know, we're supposed to have other people helping him. But, okay, I, since I have you as a guest, uh, what do you do that's funny? What do you mean? Well, <laughs> you have to clarify that because... <laughs> well, well, you're a historical satirist. And yeah. what you do in your presentation is to use humor. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, yeah, I... <laughs> I, uh, I, I think, well, my, my generally as a person, I'm, uh, uh, quite curious and, um, can't help joking about just about anything. So, and I studied history in university and so, the, so my work now is really just a con con is, is a extension of my personality in a way. Um, and also my experience. So when uh, looking at skipped history, lowercase s, lowercase h in this instance, I, uh, I am looking for ways to tell stories that haven't been told because they can be really, really hard to tell. And the way I look for ways to retell those stories in ways that are more digestible is to find little tidbits of information that are actually quite amusing, uh, at least in, in, in my opinion. So for example, um, there, I, I always remember this description of, um, 
John Foster Dulles, Secretary of State in the U.S. in the 1950s. And he and his brother, Alan Dulles, who was director of the CIA at the same time, so they're both in the Eisenhower administration, they both inspired U.S. interventions together uh, in other countries that had ex just devastating, devastating effects all over the world, whether it be in Central America uh, or Asia or even Africa. It's just, there are a lot of them, and they're just a lot of them. Uh, but so they're, they're pretty brutal figures of, of history, but they had some very funny picadillos. And <laughs> there is stuff with John Foster Dulles where he would, at dinner parties, stir his drink with his index finger, which is disgusting <laughs> and, and unexpected from the, the most powerful countries in the world's top diplomat. But it's also very evocative of who he was and his, his arrogance and his kind of, um, uh, his stubbornness and his, his black and white viewpoint of the world and good versus evil, capitalism versus communism. All these things I think are evoked a little bit by his, his confidence to be at a dinner party and stir his drinks <laughs> with his finger. And so I look for those kinds of little details that can bring stories to life in ways that both are amusing, but also give viewers and or listeners um, information that, that, that helps uh, illuminate the time and the people who I'm, who I'm talking about. Okay. Um, you know, I wanted to talk to you about the Iran-Contra affair. And uh, I think you and I agreed to start with Guatemala, which is great. Um, the Iran-Contra affair, I, I know a little more about. And I remember when I read the book, uh, White Rage, mm -hmm. by, Carol Bond, by Carolyn Bond. I, mm -hmm. I hope I'm getting him. No, I'm not. Um, but Carol Anderson, sorry. Um, and she wrote about how the CIA financed that by putting drugs into South LA. And I, seriously, this was just about six years ago. And I said, no, that couldn't happen. I, I, so I... I guess as I'm going along and even as I'm listening to you, I'm going to be learning stuff because I think I approached history in a very naive way coming up. I'm a lot more, hmm, a little more savvy now. So can we talk about Guatemala? Sure. Yeah, well, absolutely. Um, the, yeah, I think there are many through threads from Guatemala to Iran. Contra, or in many, put another way, many through threads from U.S. led coup in Guatemala in 1954 to the CIA's activity in Nicaragua 30-ish years later. Um, and I, 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 yeah, so Guatemala, um, and yeah, the caveat here is I'm, I am, I've just read about these things and thought about them a lot. So I'm not an expert, just to what you might say, a, a comedic enthusiast. But um, so there's this book called Bitter Fruit, which I actually have right here, which is uh, about the US led coup in Guatemala, which is where uh, almost all of my knowledge on the event comes from. And there's actually, Speaking of Central American coups, a shout out also to Empire's Workshop by Greg Grandin, which is where my, my knowledge about uh, Iran Contra comes from. He might actually, <laughs> sorry, here we go. The, he actually has an updated version of the book, which I should uh, be, be bumping instead. This is one that I read in college. This is one that he's since sent me. Anyway, um, U.S. the coup in Guatemala to, um, to, to put in, in terms that are similar to, to Nicaragua, or it's just, that's very, it, it's a similarly Cold War framed battle of trying to defeat communism. So 
the CIA, you know, the, in, in the 1980s in Nicaragua, um, there are Cold War warriors in the Reagan administration who uh, want to redeem the U.S. after its, uh, in, their, in their view, uh, embarrassing loss in Vietnam, and they want to restore the U.S.'s uh, proper standing in the world, and the way to do that in their minds, this, talking about people like Oliver North, for example, uh, is by fighting communism in other countries like Nicaragua. And in 1979, the Sandinistas uh, socialist regime um, had toppled a US, uh, US backed dictator. So the Reagan administration or people in the Reagan administration saw Nicaragua as a way to uh, restore US might in the world, at least from a perception standpoint. And in a, a related, Related framing, U.S. led coup in Guatemala in 1954 is very much about the Alan Dulles is, is director of the CIA. John Foster Dulles, the guy who stirred his drinks with his index finger, is Secretary of State. They're both devoutly religious, and as part of their worldview, uh, they see uh, they see their framing of foreign affairs as good versus evil. And I'm sorry, what religion are they? I think they might be, well, they're, it's, which denomination, let's see. They're Protestant, probably. I think, I think so. Here's a, this is a book by Stephen Kinzer. Oh, no, that's a different book about them. There's a book by Stephen Kinzer that's about the Dallas Brothers, which is where I know their information. Um, okay, you can look that up. Okay. Um, anyway, um, they... They decide in 19, late 1953 that they want to topple the president of Guatemala. And Guatemala had a democratic structure of governance for all of 10 years by that point. Um, so the Spanish had occupied or you know, invaded and held Guatemala for a long time. And I forget when they first arrived, maybe it was the 1500s, 1600s. I could be totally off base here. Like I said, not an expert, but I think they were, the Spanish were there until 18, the 1820s or so. And then um, there was about a century, uh, over a century of dictatorship in Guatemala that kept an oligarchical structure in place. And fast forward to 1944, there's a teacher led revolution that totally transforms the country. And it's a very exciting time. Um, they elect uh, Juan Jose Arevalo as the, the country's first president soon thereafter. And he and his, his, his successor, uh, Jacobo Arbenz, they both institute uh, many reforms, including land reform that remove some of the power of United Fruit, the giant fruit company that controls the country and much of Central America at that point in time. And Alan and John, who had both worked as lawyers for United Fruit in the past, uh, decide to lead this coup in, in Guatemala. Well, they push Eisenhower to, to approve it, and Eisenhower does both to shore up United Fruit's holdings and also as this so-called battle against communism and because they, they used the land reform acts that Arevalo and Arbenz had passed in Guatemala as justification or as proof that there was a communist conspiracy. And yeah, they lead this devastating coup that it's actually this sordid type of psychological warfare where no, uh, no real shots are really ever fired, but they do things like from the U.S. Embassy, like play radio recordings uh, or rec play recordings of bombings, and they create this environment where it seems like the country's being overrun, overrun by rebels, but really not much is actually happening. But the president, Hakobo Arbenz, is is tricked and he steps down. And yeah, the U.S. Uh, U.S. backed. A uh, leader comes in, and then there's a succession of other U.S. back leaders, all of whom roll back all the democratic reforms. And yeah, it's the country. The civil war breaks out in the 1960s, more or less, or an insurrection breaks out that leads to all-out civil war. And it's like 30 years later, hundreds of thousands of people have died. And 
it's just it's just awful. But the 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 uh, author of one of the authors of Bitter Fruit, uh, Stephen Schlesinger, his one of his main arguments is that this coup is what incepted migration from Central America to the U.S. Uh, and yeah, I think I think for lack of better phrasing, his argument bears fruit. So it's a it, yeah, it's just a it's a very uh, upsetting but very interesting and, and illuminating uh, episode in U.S. history. Sorry to be rambling about it for so long. No, no, no. I asked you, um, but I I do want to just mention that I mean few people really talk about today, or I haven't heard many people talk about the fact that many of the immigrants from Central America have kind of been forced here by the chaos imposed by the United States and by, let's say, United Fruit and the various invasions and control, and that a lot of the people who have come here really don't want to be coming here. They want to be staying in their own countries, but they just want safety in their own countries and they want jobs. But if America has taken over that property and then the chaos that's ensued has been conducive to gang structures, um, we've sort of invited these people here and then we treat them as if we don't understand like why they're coming and they're just criminals but we have in a sense created criminal structure uh, so um i just you know before we get to the iran contra if you're teaching in texas and okay i shouldn't keep saying texas if you're teaching in atmospheres that um don't want to hear this or this is, you know, uh, treason. Um, I, you know, I mean, one of the things that I've thought of is teaching more that in terms of being heroes, that telling the truth can be heroic and facing the truth can be heroic and can be a sign of bravery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, as a person who's Jewish, uh, you know, I've always thought of the fact that Germans teaching the Holocaust and paying reparations. I'm not, I don't know enough about the kind of job they're actually doing, but, but the fact that they have done this and it's been mandated, um, you know, to me is inspiring. And I think that, um, it's kind of a shame that so much of the country sees this um, as critical race theory and, you know, the fact of teaching systemic racism or teaching the facts about how America did damage in Central America as treasonous, as is just um, a sad, also a sad state. Yeah, yeah. Um... Yeah, I mean, I think then I think that goes back to our, our earlier, our, uh, what we were talking about at the beginning of, of what, of differing perceptions of what it means to teach about the past. Yeah. And to contextualize the teaching of history, which is something I, I muse on and research uh, more than is, is healthy for <laughs> For, for someone in January in a pandemic. <laughs> but I think battles over over the US historical memory have have gone on since since the begin since that me memory uh, began forming. Like people began arguing about how to present the Civil War almost as soon as the Civil War ended with the with Confederate apologists largely winning that battle and getting their version of the Civil War or the reasons for the Civil War and the, the, the um, laudable motivations of the Confederacy. Those, the, the Confederate apologists got their version of history written into textbooks that were in use well until, well through the 50s. And that only began to change in the 60s and even then 
um, the introduction of of black history and, and indigenous history and the history of Japanese Americans and, and lots of other people was still quite watered down. And that information is still watered down in classrooms across the US because the, the people still disagree on what the point of teaching history is. And because a lot of people are, are bigoted and don't want to teach anything but a, a very uh, heroic version of the past. So it's no surprise that this kind of information about Guatemala or Nicaragua wouldn't make its way into classrooms or into the into the national memory. But as you said at the beginning, and I think is is something that you you think is important. I agree. Is like the less you talk about this stuff, the more likely it is to to occur again. And you know, the U.S. is just has just adapted to. I mean, we just ended the longest war in the country's history. And with devastating, devastating consequences. And it was that war had a lot of parallels to the US war in the Philippines and, and that began in 1898. So, and that kind of and material about that war, not too much makes its way into classrooms either. So it's just like, you know, this, this, this historical forgetting has been going on for a long time and the consequences continue to play out predictably, you know, and that's, not okay with with us and it is okay with, with some people i guess uh but again those people's those people's uh that straw those straw people's uh perceptions of those events would be very different from ours anyway um you, know, um you know sometimes i've thought about the role of psychology and i had a recent guest who was suggesting that somebody say come on guys let's not be toddlers anymore. And I, you know, I, I mentioned that when Obama spoke about the, um, the massacre of kids in Connecticut, he, he said, listen guys, basically, this is not who we are. And I thought, no, don't do that. You know, this is a moment, this is a potential turning point. Say, guys, this is who we are, we need to fix it. We need to look at it. It's like, I'm thinking now, because here's the way my mind goes, you know, it races maybe differently than yours, but I'm thinking of this as a sport. And I'm thinking of, you know, training. I'm thinking of, or training as growing up, thinking of kind of like rah-rah Chile. You know, you can do this. We mm -hmm. can do this. We can learn to play tennis. We can learn to get facts right. We can learn to want facts. We can develop our muscles, you know, the, and we can develop a different kind of muscle memory or muscle openness to the truth because this, we're, this is a sickness, you know, uh, not to be able to deal with the truth. And, you know, history to me was getting at the truth, even though I... I was hero worshiping. I, I mean, but you know, to me, if it, it's like science, if you learn something that's new, even if it's upsetting, you have to deal with it. You know, you have to kind of have ways to deal with it. You can't say, no, I don't like that. You know, uh, you have to say, I need to make it work. Now, there are some people who make religion work with science, you know, they're religious, but they, well, I don't want to idealize the Pope or anybody, but, you know, the Pope is into science and history and into peacemaking and into socialism. I mean, because socialism is sharing, it's not, you know, he doesn't think of it as like you're a communist or you're an anti everything. So anyway, that's just some of my ramblings. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, ra ramble away. Um, yeah, it's a, I think it's a, it's such a, I, I, it's such a hard, uh, it's such a hard task to, I think it is imbued in national character not to face the truth, at least for, for people who want the, the social hierarchy as it is and as it has been for a long, long time to, to persist. So, uh, so I, maybe we, I'm sorry. 
No, please. Maybe we need our history courses to be taught by young kids because I mean, young kids are so curious. They really are curious and they ask difficult questions. So yeah. now that would be funny, a toddler teaching. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, there's a, it's too, there's the, um, there's a question of like, people, when I read about history stuff, there's always a question of what age do you start teaching kids? The, uh, like, at what age can kids really start processing like hard truths about like s slavery, for example? And I don't, I don't, I don't have, I don't have kids. I don't remember being that young. I wonder what, what is your sense of that? Because to me, it's like, you should just start teaching them the truth, <laughs> you know, when it comes up. But what do you, what do you think of that? I, I kind of agree. I mean, I, I can be a little skittish um, mm -hmm. too because I have a granddaughter and we saw part of the Lion King until she stopped us because it was like a little disturbing. And I was going to leave like the difficult moments for her parents, my daughter. But as I, I was putting her to sleep that night because her parents were out and as she was almost falling asleep, it was like, why did the Lion King die? why didn't he hold on? Mm -hmm. And then it was like, well, his brother pushed him. So why did his brother push him? Like, shit, excuse me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think I'm allowed to say this because it's my podcast, but um, I think Edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't edit it out. Uh, I'm, I'm a New Yorker, come on. Yeah. Um, so, um, but I think that, uh, you know, I'm into teaching about the shadow. We all have good and bad. So we all have different motives. And, you know, like people can be selfish. Like they weren't thinking of the other people. They just thought about what they needed and they didn't see the other people as real people. As mm -hmm. I'm saying it to you, it doesn't seem so hard to say. Mm -hmm. You know, it was like a crisis of humanity that you know, like people can be very mean and when they don't learn to care about each other and care about themselves, right. because it's not just empathy of, you know, toward other people, it's empathy towards ourselves. And when you don't have empathy, you can make people subhuman. And once you do that, yeah, it's over. So yeah, do we have time for the Iran Contra? I mean, sure. I don't you know, like, you know, this is very, very important, like that I think, and I think I could help with that. You know, I once took um, an adolescent version of the Passover story and I made it into a toddler-esque kind of thing. And it was very compelling and really interesting. And I think, I think we could do it. I just, and, and, and as I'm saying, I'm kind of getting excited because I'm thinking that some of us could come up with ideas because it's, it's what you're doing is great, but, but it can be added to, and you don't have to do the adding to it, but other people can do the, ha, how to do this in a way that is not, meant and people don't have to see it as men to tear themselves down. It's a, you know, it's meant to become a real human being and become better and become braver. Okay. Sorry. Iran Contra. No, no. Uh, well, Iran Contra. Uh, Iran Contra is a, a complicated, it's a complicated one. Um, and I, I would say uh, for any if for anyone <laughs> listening or watching, I uh, skip. There are skipped history videos on Guatemala and Iran Contra that are more cohesive and more coherent than anything I will say <laughs> off of a not off of a script that I've written and memorized. Um, so I encourage you to 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 get it to 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 check those out. But um, yeah, Iran Contra is as I mentioned, just like a war hungry faction in the Reagan administration, many of whom are Vietnam vets eager to, to, to restore the, their perception of the U S standing in the world. Um, illegally set up an operation in Nicaragua, um, where they're funding the Contras, 
a rebel group, a rebel group that's in opposition to the Sandinistas. It's illegal because Congress outlawed funding to the Contras and because they were, they were quite violent and the U S the CIA, different, different people in the Reagan administration continue that funding, um, by selling missiles to Iran secretly and using the proceeds, uh, sending the proceeds to the Contras in Nicaragua. It sounds as Every time I say it out loud, it is as insane sounding as it it seems to be in practice. And yeah, eventually this the operation comes crashing down. So it starts in 1981, comes crashing down in 1984 when the Sandinistas shot down a helicopter that turned out to be carrying U.S. financed mercenaries. And this leads to a huge scandal that almost brings down Reagan. His popularity implodes, uh, but he survives the scandal and pretty much no one is held accountable. And uh, I'm sorry, can, can I interrupt you to ask sure. you about crack cocaine? Sure. What's it? Uh, it's, I would say it's probably like $40 a gram, but let me see if I have any any good deals on the no i mean i mean the cia f selling oh sorry sorry <laughs> i thought you were asking me um yeah, so what the the c what is the what do you you tell me what is this uh, what is this well, i uh, i read in the book white rage that part of the funding came from the cia selling or buying crack cocaine from Colombia and mm -hmm. selling it in South yeah. Africa, creating an epidemic. Yeah, there are, hold on a second. You're reminding me of a, Greg Grandin talks about this. Um, let's see if I can find it. I, I recall contours of that. Um, there are some really, insane, insane details of this. Oh, here we go. Um, yeah, so uh, again, I'm. this is an Empire's Workshop by Greg Grandin, which is about Latin America, the United States, and the making of an imperial republic. It is really a, a fantastic book. Um, and so he... He talks about this um, in 1996. There, it's revealed that the Contras were supplying the cocaine that helped kick off uh, South Central LA's crack epi epidemic. Uh, they were not new allegations. There was this uh, right there. So there's this very. Um, I have to read this to you. There's this, so John Kerry, in who's a senator at the time. He leads this investigation of Iran Contra that comes out a few years afterward. It comes out in 1988. So this is a little bit when the brouhaha after after the brouhaha brouhaha has quieted down. Love the word brouhaha. And I'll just read you this this bit from Grandin's book because it it boggles the mind. He says, pick any one paragraph of the Kerry Committee report on the CIA and drug running, and your mind will be sent spinning. Colombia, Cuba, Miami, Israel, Panama, Haitian secret police, Saudi Arabia, South Africa, Argentina, suitcases stuffed with stacks of $100,000 bills, the Cuban CIA operative who captured Che Guevara, che Guevara in Bolivia, agents, double agents, spies, and corrupt military officials and drug running defense contractors. All of these things are part of the Iran-Contra scandal. And there is even an, an episode where U.S. government officials gave the green light to a Colombian drug trafficker who testified that he smuggled drugs into the U.S. in exchange for the U.S.'s use of a Bahamian island to ship weapons to the Nicaraguan Contras. And that the Medellin cartel gave $10 million to the Contras and the CIA knew about it. And this goes on. I've seen this. I've looked at this document. It is unbelievable. And, and it's all, it's, it's a, it's a, it's his, it's public record published by Congress and no one, no one is, is ever held accountable for any of this. And can you imagine if just one of these things happened today, social media would explode 
Like, but this, this was almost like, there was too much that went on. It was very, very Trumpian in its just overload of wrongdoing that you didn't know where to start. And so much of it was buried in these reports that it's only surfaced in, in bits and pieces as the years wore on. It's just, and this is why Iran-Contra is just, as I said, is just so, even as, as much as it is recalled as, as, a, as a crazy event, it is just so much more explosive and mind boggling than I, I, can wrap, I can wrap my head around. I need you to say the name of that book again, please. Sure. It's called Empire's Workshop oh. by Greg Grandin, who is a wonderful, wonderful historian. You know, I, I, I have to say, okay, Greg Grandin, Empire's Workshop. Um, this podcast is brought to you by Greg Grandin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all of my work is brought to you by Greg Grandin. Um, I think, you know, I have to say, when I read this in Carol Anderson's book, which is really about racism and, and white rage and white jealousy of black people who are, you know, like rising. And I said, I, I can't believe this. It's just, I didn't know any of it. I, I didn't stop and concentrate on it. It's just not possible. So I actually Googled it and it was possible. It was what is her, what is her framing of this story within the, the context of white rage or, or resistance to truth? Well, uh, I mean, she talks a lot about the history of racism and she talks a lot about white people be, being um, upset at the, at the rise of, of black people in terms of power and um, jobs and, and so she, she concentrates on the Colombian um, and all those other people. I don't know that she mentions all of them, but she talks about uh, shoving, dumping crack cocaine mm. on who black, um, the black ghettos of uh, South LA and creating the first crack cocaine epidemic in the United States and really kind of again, like creating disaster. Right. Um, and then of course that, that just um, amplifies the right of white establishment to see black people as drug addicts, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, because, you know, it was, it was very tempting and it was, that it was dumped by CIA agents. It was like, no, no, that, and I mean, you know, mind you, I consider myself a liberal. This was like way out of the park for me. So I, I, and, and I've started to expand my horizons in not such a pleasant way, but I feel like it's important, you know? Yeah. So I, I feel like we can't afford to skip it. And even though you mentioned all those people, I, I have to buy the book and I have to, you know, read about it because we think that Israel is against Saudi Arabia or, or maybe not, but, you know, we think that Cuba didn't exist as a, as a friend, but it did when I guess it was wanted. So, I mean, I think all this is so important. And I think the, the issue that I guess I raised, but we both, you know, raised of, how people can wrap their heads around this and see this as a value, you know, as a value system, as part of a value system that we want to know the truth. So, you know, if in when I do psychotherapy, I, I, I have to admit that psychotherapy is at least as I see it has a value system. It, it believes in finding out where a person is stuck and helping them become who they are. And I'm just using the pronoun for convenience sake right now. Mm -hmm. But, and that is, and, and that a developmental point of view, understanding what a kid is going through developmentally rather than just wanting that kid to go to Harvard at three or show that potential, you know, is important. So I can say that out loud. 
I would love it if this country starts having a value system that we want to know the truth and that we want to be able to handle it. You know, a lot of us are old enough to have seen a few good men. And when Jack Nicholson does the wild and crazy scene of you want the truth, you can't handle the truth. You know, we thought he's a bad guy. You know, he's he was saying we are on guard so you don't have to handle the truth because you don't want to know what we do. And I'm thinking, you know, he's a bad guy. But and he was a pretty bad guy, but he was right. So I'd like to feel that what's your purpose in, in you know, educating is, is, to, is to know the truth, but to be able to handle it and not to have to be like a dictatorship where people breastfeed us on lies. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, I think you could look at a transcript of, of what you said, much of which I agree with. And it, you could easily attribute it to a conspiracy theorist of some kind who is also in their mind searching for, for truth. I think truth is a very tricky word. Um, I would tend to agree with you, I think, <laughs> on what it might mean. I mean, that's why I'm so interested in excavating historical events because the historical record to me, the the record of of, of, of events that have you know, that have primary source documentation of, ha of having occurred is, is, is the, the, the base of the true so-called truth to me. Um, but I think it's even, even if your value system is getting at the truth, I don't know. I don't know how much it's, I don't know how much it solves, you know, I don't know. I, how much it solves? what I'm sorry, how much it solves. Yeah. Like, I guess what is the, like, what's the, end? my question would be, what's the end goal? This is not, this is just to, uh, I'm thinking out loud because, because I agree with you, but it, it's, if you're, people have always thought that they've been, you know, putting the truth out there in different ways, you know, like if we're using any of the examples we've talked about, like the Dulles brothers in the fifties to go back to them thought that they were iterating or excuse me, they were articulating the truth and saying there was a, a battle of good versus evil. And our definition of the truth is different, but Every in every in every era, people think that they're putting the truth forward. I think we're getting closer to actually maybe what it might be. But then again, everybody's probably thought that to some extent. So I'm I'm just wondering, like, how how do we know that what we're doing is different and actually can can change a societal structure that doesn't work for so many people? Oh, it's a good question. I mean, I can I can only tell you that I'm not even saying that I am. Um, I. I am having success at my own goal, but my, but part of my own goal as to, is to question our assumptions. Mm -hmm. So I can only tell you that when I That's wrote a good my point. chapel, mm -hmm. I came, I, I had a lot of hard, hard moments about myself. I realized how ignorant I was. I realized, you know, I, I read Richard Hofstadter. It's a 1950 book. It's still good. I mean, mm -hmm. he said that Lincoln said this at this place and that at that place. Now, I believe him. I think there are historical records. So he was a bit of a hypocrite and he was a manipulator. I mean, he was many things, okay? But it was like, oh my God, he said, I don't want, I don't want like Negroes to be equal to us. I don't want them to vote. And he said that. So okay, now I have to sort of say, wow, what, what does that do to me? What does that do to my structure? Because I think if we know the truth, let's say even about our own families um, or our own addictive or someone's own addictive relationships, mm -hmm. if we start knowing the truth about ourselves, we can grieve the losses and start 
doing things differently and start caring. You know, if we can, because it's not what I said to you before, I don't think it's only about learning about history. I think it's about mm. caring about history and, yeah. And, yeah. and sort of redoing the scene so that we can see the film or read the book or have the feelings that we can humanize ourselves and other people and so that we can care deeply. And once we care deeply, we can care deeply about the climate. We can care deeply, not just about um, capitalism or the fact that we have to prove that we are okay. And that we, because it really is about caring. You know, that's, that's the thing. It's not just about learning. Because if you learn and you become mechanical and you recite a bunch of facts, but you don't care, then I don't know how much you're learning. I think the learning process has to be emotional also. And I think we underestimate the role of emotion. You know, as I say, you know, I, I don't like to say this so much, but that emotions trump facts because it isn't, and thinking, you can't really think if you're driven to want to have a certain conclusion. If you, if you can't attach from the outcome, you really can't learn. And, and I am saying this as someone, you know, I wrote this chapter, but I was writing about myself. You know, I didn't really kind of know it. I didn't know much about history. And now what I can say is I begin to know how much I don't know. So I'm a little more open. Yes. And, and if I can be a little more open, then I can include other people in my view. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't have to say I'm American and everything about me and everything about the facts I learned has to be beautiful. I can say, okay, I can look around and I can meet different people and I can. So again, I think it's, it's, it's learning in a very deep set, you know, sense. Like you can't, if you don't learn from history, you'll repeat it. But if you don't learn deep, deep, deeply, it's going to be mechanical. It's not going to go anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that's a really, that's a nice way to put it. And I appreciate your, your answer. Cause I think you're touching on, you know, questioning of one's self assumptions and openness to, to being wrong are, and, and curiosity combined are make for, a, a path toward, you know, learning and, and, uh, and caring, like you're saying. And I think that that also ties back to your earlier comment about the insecurity of, of learning and, and, and accepting maybe that you can't possibly know, accepting that you, there's, there's much more you don't know about than that, than you do, you know? And I think that's a, I think you're you're right that that is if there to me if there if there is a path to truth then then that's it and I would just add to bump my favorite people in the world aka historians it's and it's a really really exciting time in the historical field as more and more historians and more and more historians of color uh, are putting out just and are given the platform to put out incredible scholarship there's many strides to be made but it's a really, it's a really exciting time. And I think that that also there, if you, if you do have that interest and openness and to, to learn, there's more and more material out there that is there to, to, to seize on. So yeah, get ready for some hard moments and a lot of crying by yourself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And well, you know, and hopefully connecting with people who are curious. Yes. And yes. To, yes you know, give a damn. And, and, you know, the more you start learning, I, I think, I think the deeper you do care. Yeah. You know, yeah. and the more you see the human faces behind the facts, totally. and then the more you see the, you know, the, you know, and the more you see the future. So, so it's not, you know, we're learning also so that our kids like might have a climate that isn't, completely decimated yeah. and that's not yeah. going to happen unless yeah. 
unless we care. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I, I thank you for your work. Skipped history is oh. the site. Yes. And <laughs> Greg Grandin is the person who has sponsored. <laughs> yes. I've mentioned Greg Grandin, Stephen Kinzer, Stephen Schlesinger. Um, and there's a book by Jane Mayer about Iran Contra that's very good too. There is. I didn't know that. Yeah, Jane Mayer and Doyle McManus have a book about Iran Contra that is it it it's more about like the fall of the Reagan almost fall of the Reagan administration during that time. Yeah, I'd like to see that because she's a lot of good books. But also, just on my side, the sponsoring has been by Catherine Schultz who wrote a really good book called Being Wrong. Okay, cool. And it okay. it really is a study of how scared we are and how at the same time we're made to be wrong. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're constructed to be wrong. And, yeah. and it's a really fascinating book. Okay. So, I wrote it. Um, let me thank you, Ben Tuman. Uh, yes, really thank you for uh, letting me persist. I mean, no, you let me persist, but, you know, for, for you know, coming here today. Oh, my, my pleasure. Thank you so much for, for inviting me and, and, and organizing it and having me. And thanks to the incredible production team behind the scenes. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it was a, it's been a real joy. I appreciate it. Okay, well... I intend to be connected to you, so. All right, likewise. Bye.